It was a cold, rainy evening in the small town of Oakwood. The clouds hung low, and a thick fog rolled in, making it hard to see anything more than a few feet ahead. The old Oakwood Manor, standing on a hill overlooking the town, seemed especially eerie that night. Mr. James Hastings, a wealthy but lonely man, owned Oakwood Manor. He had inherited it from his father, who had inherited it from his father before him. Mr. Hastings was known for his love of antiques and old books. He spent most of his days reading in his grand library, surrounded by dusty volumes and ancient artifacts. One evening, Mr. Hastings decided to host a dinner party. He invited a few close friends, Mrs. Emily Clark, a charming widow, Mr. Robert Brooks, his loyal lawyer, Miss Clara Thompson, a young and curious journalist, and Mr. Henry Davis, his distant cousin. The guests arrived at Oakwood Manor just as the storm began to rage outside. The dinner was exquisite, with fine wine and delicious food. The guests chatted and laughed, but an underlying tension was palpable. Mr. Hastings seemed distracted, glancing at the old grandfather clock in the corner of the room every few minutes. After dessert, he excused himself to the library, leaving his guests to entertain themselves. As the night went on, the storm grew fiercer. The wind howled, and the rain pounded against the windows. Suddenly, the lights flickered and went out, plunging the house into darkness. Mrs. Clark let out a small scream, and Mr. Brooks quickly found a candle to light. Everyone, stay calm, Mr. Brooks said, his voice steady. I'll go check the fuse box. Mr. Brooks left the room, and the others huddled together, the candle casting long, dancing shadows on the walls. Minutes later, a loud crash echoed through the house, followed by a blood-curdling scream. The guests froze in fear. That came from the library. Miss Thompson exclaimed. Without thinking, she grabbed the candle and led the way down the dark hallway, the others close behind her. They reached the library and found the door slightly ajar. Pushing it open, they were met with a horrifying sight. Mr. Hastings lay on the floor, a pool of blood forming around him. His antique dagger, usually displayed above the fireplace, was now plunged into his chest. Mrs. Clark fainted, and Mr. Davis caught her just in time. Miss Thompson, though shaken, kept her wits about her. We need to call the police, she said. Mr. Brooks, who had just returned from the basement, nodded and went to find a phone that still worked. Within half an hour, the police arrived. Detective Sarah Miller, a sharp and experienced investigator, took charge. She gathered everyone in the drawing room and began her questioning. Let's start with where everyone was when the lights went out. Detective Miller said, her keen eyes observing each of them closely. Mrs. Clark, now revived, spoke first. We were all in the dining room, except for Mr. Hastings. He went to the library. Did anyone leave the dining room after the lights went out? The detective asked. Mr. Brooks cleared his throat. I went to check the fuse box but I didn't see or hear anything unusual until we heard the scream. Miss Thompson added, I went to the library with the candle as soon as we heard the noise. Detective Miller nodded. And you, Mr. Davis? Did you leave the dining room? Mr. Davis shook his head. No, 
I stayed with Mrs. Clark. The detective then examined the library. She noted the broken window, which seemed to suggest a forced entry. However, there were no muddy footprints or signs of an intruder. This dagger, she said, pointing to the weapon, is from Mr. Hastings' collection. Whoever did this didn't bring a weapon with them. Detective Miller then found a small piece of paper clenched in Mr. Hastings' hand. It was a torn corner of a letter, with the words will, and threaten visible. She showed it to the guests. Does anyone recognize this handwriting? She asked. Mr. Brooks paled. It looks like mine, he admitted, but I don't remember writing anything like that. Detective Miller continued to question the guests, but no clear motive or suspect emerged. She decided to search the house for more clues. As she examined Mr. Hastings' study, she found the rest of the letter in the trash bin. It read, James, if you change your will to exclude me, I will make sure everyone knows your secrets. Don't test me, Robert. Detective Miller returned to the drawing room and confronted Mr. Brooks. Care to explain this? She asked, holding up the letter. Mr. Brooks stammered. I was upset. James told me he was changing his will to leave everything to charity. I felt betrayed. But I didn't kill him. Detective Miller wasn't convinced. Your motive is clear, and your handwriting matches. But let's see if the others can confirm your alibi. She turned to Mrs. Clark and Mr. Davis. Did either of you see Mr. Brooks after he left to check the fuse box? Mrs. Clark shook her head. Mr. Davis hesitated, then said, I thought I saw a shadow in the hallway, but I can't be sure who it was. Miss Thompson spoke up. Detective, I think you should know something. Mr. Hastings confided in me recently. He said he suspected someone was stealing from his collection. He was planning to confront them tonight. Detective Miller considered this new information. She decided to search the guest's belongings. In Mr. Brooks' briefcase, she found several small, valuable artifacts from Mr. Hastings' collection. It seems Mr. Hastings confronted you about the theft, and you killed him in a panic. Detective Miller concluded. Mr. Brooks broke down and confessed. It's true. I stole from him. When he confronted me, I lost control. I didn't mean to kill him. Detective Miller nodded, satisfied. You're under arrest, Mr. Brooks. As the police took Mr. Brooks away, the storm began to subside. Oakwood Manor stood silent once more, its secrets uncovered, and its peace restored.